Thank you so much. I uh, am always amazed that I'm standing in a church doing the lecture. <laughs> I called my mother last night and I said, she's over 80 years old, and I said, Mom, I'm going to be speaking at a church tomorrow. And there was a long pause and she said, Are you studying to be a priest now? <laughs> <laughs> My passion is the mystery of the self and who we are as individuals and demystifying those concepts. And I've spent the last at least 30 years of my life looking into what that means from a scientific standpoint. And I think that truly science is the contemporary language of spirituality. I think science is the language of mysticism. And <clears throat> I'm not one of those people and have never been one of those people that take things at face value that I have a passion to investigate. And it helps me close the gap on a personal level to understand who we are. And if you look at quantum physics, the physics of possibility, it's really talking about the spiritual aspect of ourselves because you couldn't explain a miracle you couldn't explain a biological process, you couldn't explain a simple healing of a cut at this point without understanding the quantum model of reality. And that there are particles, which are matter, it's you and I, and everything in this physical world, and then there's energy. And that energy has a consciousness, it has an awareness, and that energy is a field of information that we are an extension of, that we have access to, and that we spend so much of our life looking outside of ourselves instead of looking inside of ourselves, and that we are really conditioned to look just for particles and matter instead of energy and information. And truly, when people reach the end of their beliefs or they're facing crisis in their life, that's the moment they start to turn within and start to ask the bigger questions. And if you were astute enough to look at this in moments of contemplation, if you were wanting to hide God anywhere, it would be a good place to hide. It would be within the human being because everybody's looking outside of themselves and we look for reasons to change and regulate our emotional states. Uh, you know, we think that things and people and, and external things will really fulfill emotions that uh, we're trying to change within us. And that truly when we start to really investigate who we are and look to see how we do that and demystify it, I think once we start to demystify it, it can become a skill. And so Descartes, the 17th century scientist, he was very interested in studying the nature of reality. He was passionate about it because he wanted to do extensive research on cadavers and he wanted to understand the world of the very large and how planets rotated around the sun. And, but he had a quandary because the church at the time didn't want him to change any of the current beliefs. So he made a very, very split decision sitting by a fountain one day and he said, okay, the best way that I continue to do my research is I am going to study the physical world of the very large, of objects and matter, and then everything that has to do with the mind, it's too convoluted and it's too unpredictable, we'll leave that to the church. So science was always matter, never mind, and the church was always mind, never matter. And the two were never to be combined. And he actually separated the idea of the mind-body connection. He thought there was mind and there was body and it was cut off at the neck. And he did that purposefully because he wanted to get the cadavers from the dead, from the church, and be able to do his research. So he was appeasing everybody in the process. And so that became the revolution of the time. And then uh, Newton came along 100 years later and he said, you know, I have the scientific laws to be able to prove everything that Newton said. He basically provided the underpinnings of understanding the nature of reality of the very large, the predictable world of Newtonian physics says that we can really predict 
where the planet's going to be in a certain amount of time, and we can shoot a rocket to the moon. And this whole idea of studying the very large an apple falls from the tree, we can figure out how fast it falls because it accelerates towards the Earth at the same speed. And Newton was a genius, and he said, "I'm standing on the shores, just on the shoreline of how big this really is, and this is what I can contribute." But he was a mystic in a lot of ways. And again, he didn't want to go against the convention at that time. So a couple hundred years later, Einstein shows up, and Einstein was a super cool guy because he spent a lot of time inward. And at 12 years old, he asked himself this simple question: If I ride my bicycle at the speed of light, and I turn my lamp on, I turn my headlight on, will it go on? And so he thought about that question every single day of his life, every day of his life. He would go out in a boat on a lake as a child and lay on the on the on the on his back in the boat and look up at the sky and think about this. And he was building models of understanding. He was working his best to be able to figure out how light and energy were related. He did it for ten years. He was possessed by the concept, and finally he was working as a third-rate. Uh, A clerk in a Swiss patent office, and he was watching this man fix the roof across the way. And he just paused for a moment, and he was watching him. And the moment he was watching him, he got this incredible vision, and he understood how light and energy were related. It was a very abstract vision, and it was so abstract and so dimensional that he had to go back to school to learn the mathematics to be able to explain what he saw. And his wife, his first wife, was an amazing scientist, and she helped him with a lot of the a lot of the mathematics. And so when Einstein began to figure it out, he narrowed it down to that one simple equation that e equals m c squared. You know, energy and matter related, and the co you know the the, the currency converter is the speed of light. And so it became very interesting because <clears throat> when Einstein published his papers on relativity. He didn't say like, "Hey, this person said this, and this person said this, and I'm going to footnote this person." Do that. He just said, "Ladies and gentlemen, this is how it is," and it rocked the scientific community because he didn't really need anybody else as a reference. He had a discovery, and his discovery was so unique, and his brain really was wired for the understanding of light, and light was the ceiling of this reality. And so Einstein and Planck started doing these really interesting experiments, where they were they were taking energy and they were putting energetic、uh, impulses into metals. And what they were looking to see is if electrons behave the same way as the very large. In other words, when an apple falls from the tree, it falls in a very specific way. It fall, falls towards the center. It falls towards the larger body. So. He reasoned, well, if we disturb electrons, and him and Planck were doing these experiments, if we disturb these electrons, then they should fall just like an apple falling from the tree towards the nucleus. It should be predictable, just like it's predictable in Newtonian physics and classical physics. Well, when they started disturbing the electrons, something very unusual happened. The, ec- the electron gained energy, then it lost energy. And it gained energy, and it lost energy, and it gained energy, and it lost energy. And instead of it falling like a ball rolling down a hill, it was Like a ball rolling down steps, all of a sudden they became very aware that the subatomic world, the very tiny, didn't behave like the very large world. And so then they started to look for the electron. They started to try to measure it, and everywhere they looked for it, it appeared. And when they turned their back on it and they no longer looked to measure it, it went from a particle that collapsed, called collapsing the wave function, back into energy. Now this was a revolutionary moment because this meant that subjective mind, your mind has an effect on the objective world. That mind and matter are somehow correlated, and though so, this birth of quantum physics came along, and this quantum physics experiments say that you cannot do a quantum physics experiment without an observer around. In other words, a mind always has, always has to be present because it will influence the outcome. You with me? So now that invisible field of spirit, that invisible field of information and energy, somehow you, as an individual, can influence the nature of reality with your mind. 
So now, Einstein had a lot of trouble with this because he said, I, you know, God doesn't play dice and it doesn't work like this, but his brain was wired for light. And so he had the abstraction and he was getting the download of information understanding the field of light. And the quantum physicists were saying, well, actually, there's a, there's a field of information beyond space and time, beyond light, where everything is unified. And you can take two photons that have been somehow related in a specific atom and shoot them to the opposite ends of the universe. And the moment you affect one photon at the exact same time, the other one is affected. So they were being connected or affected in a realm faster than the speed of light. In other words, it would take time if you affected one for the other one to be affected. But if they were beginning to be affected at the exact same time, they were connected in a realm beyond physical reality. Are you with me? And so when the movie What the Bleep came out, and we basically made an effort to show that your mind has an effect on reality, and that in order for you to begin to change your reality, you got to change your mind and change the way you live your life. And we wanted people to become inspired by the process of creation. Really, give it a shot. And that, that, that independent of your gender, of your race, of the color of your skin, of your intellectual ability, independent of your past, independent of your age, that on some level we are all divine creators and that these models of reality that have separated individuals have all been built on human beings living in a very limited state of mind. And so when quantum physics was born and the whole concept of reality began to unfold, uh, people started to really challenge the nature of reality and that, and that concept that you are somehow connected because you are made of photons and atoms and electrons, that on some level, you are an organization, a community of 70 trillion to 120 trillion cells, and all of those cells are made up of atoms and molecules and chemicals. And all of those are working in a coherent form to express yourself as a physical body. But most people don't know that they're moving in and out of the quantum field 7.8 times per second. That you're vibrating in and out of the field all the time, and every time you leave, you disappear, and when you come back, you, co you disappear into that field of information, and you come back with information. But if you go out as the same person, you don't bring any new information back. Are you with me? So now I, I have sat with quantum physicists till sunrise, drinking martinis, arguing the quantum reality. And I can tell you, after many, many long nights of arguing and cigar smoke and switching from vodka to gin martinis and <laughs> coffee martinis. <laughs> I mean, these are published physicists. <clears throat> they always ended the conversation with the same thing. Well, I like the idea that subjective mind has an effect on the objective world. We believe that, but only for the very tiny. In other words, mind has an effect on the very tiny and not on the very large. The observer effect only works for the very tiny. And I would sit there and say to them, well, maybe we're just poor observers. Maybe we can get better at the concept of observation. And so that led me to the mystery of understanding how we can begin to influence or change our mind. Because if you're able to harness a greater ability of mindfulness, you should be able to exert greater effects on your world. And if you can begin to observe a vision that represents a future, and you can hold steadfast to that vision, and you can see that vision clearly in your mind, and every day you understand where you place your attention is where you place your energy, then you would be investing your energy into the future. And the image that you see could literally be the template for trillions and trillions of atoms to organize into patterns of information called an event in your life. And so, but it's not enough to just have a clear intention because clear intentions have very little effect on the nature of reality. That the driving force that couples, the, the co-maiden, the, the handmaiden to all of that is an elevated emotion. That when people start to open their hearts and they move out of those limited states of anger and frustration and prejudice and impatience and hatred and judgment and fear, it's those emotions that cause us to feel more like matter and less like energy, separate from that field. 
The very nature of those chemicals cause us to define reality with our senses as materialists. So we're only looking for the particle instead of possibility. But when you start to open your heart and you go contrary to the jungle, because it's not a good idea to open your heart when there's predators and danger out there. And this is what mystics and the great charismatic leaders have talked about for many, many years, is that you have to lay down the very thing you used your whole life to get what you want for something greater to occur. You have to begin to do what's unnatural. And so when you combine that clear intention with an elevated emotion, it is the elevated emotion that begins to amplify the field around your body. And in that moment, you become more energy and less matter. And if you understand then that the emotion then is the handmaiden to the creative process, that means that you would have to feel whole before your healing. That would mean that you would have to feel abundance before your wealth. That means you would have to feel awe before the mystical moment. That would mean you'd have to feel love before your new relationship. That would mean you'd have to feel empowered before your success. And that means then, when we do this properly, then we're no longer functioning as materialists. We are literally function as quantum minds. And so the research now has proven, and we've done enough research in our own studies as well, that you can change your brain. And that when you begin to go inward, and you look at the garden of your mind, the garden of your mind, you have to look at, before you plant a new garden, those plants from the past, from last year. You gotta look at the weeds that have grown because you haven't been paying attention. You gotta look at those rocks that have sifted to the top that represent your emotional blocks. You gotta look at those trees that need some pruning. You gotta look at that soil that's become hardened and rigid, fixed and habituated. And you have to light a match in a dark place and you gotta begin the process. And pulling out the weeds that are the old thoughts that slip by our awareness takes awareness. And consciousness is awareness, and awareness is paying attention. We have to look at those rocks that have sifted to the top and remove those emotional blocks. Because we can. We have to pull the past away. We have to tenderize and break down the rigidity of that soil. And now it's time to plant the garden. And it takes time for the garden to grow. It takes attention to nurture it. It takes paying attention to those weeds that want to come up. And every season, you're going to have to prune it. And every season, you're going to have to care for it. And there's never an end to the garden that we grow. And so you, subjective mind, have a consciousness because the brain will never change the brain. And I've studied it enough times to tell you that the mind will never change the brain because the mind is the brain in action. But who's doing the changing of the brain and the mind? And it's that nasty 13-letter word that scientists hate called consciousness. You, the immaterial aspect of you, that individual journeyman or journeywoman on the journey back to source, using a brain and body to produce different levels of mind. And only when you're truly conscious and truly aware are you beginning to affect the nature of reality? And taking small moments in your busy life to understand that when your consciousness merges with a greater consciousness, when you're connected to source, you will emulate the divine. And how would the divine live if it was you? Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.